Good afternoon. It's Friday the 24th of June 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And we will be joined by live um, Skype link by David Scott from Northern Exposure. Well, of course, it's Friday and that means the result is out. And of course, the result was a very clear leave vote. Consequently, the sun is shining in Plymouth and uh, the weather across the rest of the country is uh, pretty good as well. Perth apparently is fluffy clouds, blue sky, sunshine, a little light rain in Manchester, but that's fairly normal. And we understand that uh, there are tropical storms in Holland and that is the actual climate. It's not the political climate at the moment. Mm. So um, tragic news, Mike, that uh, Will Straw is missing. It is tragic. Um, of course, this was the man who came out of nowhere, little job, which I would presume his daddy set up for him, Britain stronger in Europe. Uh, but apparently he's not to be seen at the moment. So I don't know where he is. I, I think I remember a game where you had to find where's Wally or something like that. You had to look for a little figure amongst a whole mass of other people. So there we are. Condolences to Will Straw. Presumably he's crawled off to a hole somewhere. Um, but we'll also bring this up on screen because this is quite extraordinary stuff or not. Uh, the Daily Mail reporting that uh, following a leaked email, um, we are able to see that the BBC utterly despises the general public. And if you dared to have believed that the uh, leave the European Union as fast as possible was the correct way to go, uh, you were just a ghastly person. Yes. Um, so if you want to read one article which illustrates what the BBC is really about, uh, that mail article um, is it, really. What a... No, I'll, I'll end it there because otherwise I'm going to say something <laughs> and we're going to spoil the no swearing rule on the UK column. But um, what we would like to say to people is whilst, of course, the result has brought a lot of happiness and joy to many individuals, uh, we think it's the start of the real battle. And it's absolutely vital that people realise that this government is not simply going to roll over and allow Britain to take back its sovereignty as a nation state. We are very confident that what follows from here on is going to be a very dark picture as the government delays, stalls and obfuscates in order to make sure this um, decision can be reversed. Uh, mm. More on that in a minute. But uh, we'd like to just take you through some of the key players in this extraordinary game of treason chess, which is being carried out by the British government. So let's see whether uh, this works. I think this is going to leave the BBC's infographics in the dust. So we've got the dark art side, of course. And uh, really good people are there playing the white pieces at the bottom of the board. So how does this map out? Well, let's see who we've got. The Queen, of course, utterly betrayed her country by accepting mediatisation, given her power away to a foreign state, the European Union. And we better bring in alongside her, of course, one of the major players in the money side of life. You're going to be mentioning him a li little bit later, Mike, but George Soros, of course, controlling br billions, blackmailing the country. And uh, what better person to have on your side than Archbishop Welby, the man who has simply refused to deal with Satanism or child abuse in the country. Uh, he prefers to uh, hobnob next to the bankers. And um, in the uh, wings, but clearly a player in British politics, we've got key individuals like Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, so the EU is effectively uh, in the British establishment and the political scene. Let's not forget people like Nick Clegg, because this man is still in the background, very, very subversive Europhile, and he worked flat out with David Cameron to try and engineer uh, UK locked into the EU. Well, the real powerhouse, Oliver Letwin, the papers not mentioning this man, but this is the man controlling the cabinet, controlling the Tory party, and also controlling, of course, the uh, behavioural insights team who've been leading the propaganda campaign. Boris Johnson, prime minister in waiting, do you think, Mike? Absolutely. 
Uh, let's bring him onto the field. And of course, this lady who is uh, silent at the moment, but uh, Theresa May, Home Secretary, nothing said uh, on the subject of Joe Cox. But of course, this woman has orchestrated the police state inside UK. Very, very dangerous individual. Propaganda. Well, there is only one organisation for that, the BBC. And of course, what do we need to do with the help of the BBC? Cover up the abuse of children by the establishment. So we've put uh, Ms Goddard there. A little bit frightening, but we'll bring her in on the black side. And uh, dark actors. So Francis Maud, UK column unique in pointing out this incestuous relationship with the political charity Common Purpose. And uh, we'd better bring in senior military. Well, as far as I'm concerned, these people, by supporting the EU, have betrayed the country. So we just bring Lord Bramall in as one example of the pro-EU brigade. He's a little bit crooked there on the screen, but not to worry. And uh, you can't do this without uh, the blessing of the intelligence services. So whether it's GCHQ or MI6 meeting at Bilderberg, um, you've got to have the security services on board. And, well, Mike, what would you like to say about Mr Corbyn? Is he in or out? We'll be talking about that in a moment. OK, we'll just pop him on the board there. And um, there she is, Nippy Sturgeon, dark arts actor. And I've put tasks to break up the union yep. because I'm sure that that's her job. And that's why she's normally dressed in red. Uh, well... If you're going to do the job, you need to have the police on side. So I've just chosen Sir Bernard Hogan Howe as an example of senior police officers clearly there to protect the establishment. How do we know something nasty is happening? Well, let's think of who we can see. So we've got soldiers such as Alexander Blackman do the job. They end up in prison. Uh, we've got children in Syria. Uh, well, suffering as a result of bombing by this uh, black elite. Uh, we've got people who stand up to be counted. This was the Muslim gentleman from Oxford tried to blow the whistle on child abuse. He was stamped on by the British state. And of course, Melanie Shaw, child abuse survivor, we now know is back in prison. More on that in due course. Uh, so we can see the casualties on the battlefield, but who are they really after? all of us, and uh, we've labelled the rest of our society there, be under no illusion this treasonous British government wants to utterly destroy the nation state and the family, and they're also playing from the wings. So let's remember that Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Brooks Newmark, Cameron, is he on the border off? It's a bit close, Mike. And also, where does the powerhouse come from? Well, Bank of International Settlements there. So these people are not going to roll over simply because there's been a leave uh, vote. David. Very interesting analysis there, Brian. Just one thing. Um, Nick Clegg. Nick Clegg's not a knight. That would have to be a pawn. Uh, well, I think that was an old nag I had on that <laughs> space, actually. But uh, I take your point. Um, well. I have to say, David, you, uh, you watched all night, but uh, uh, some of the reaction from some of the politicians was spectacularly good. Uh, Keith Vaz particularly stood out for me. In a thousand years, I would never have believed the British people would have voted in this way, and they've done so. Uh, I think emotionally, rather than looking at the facts, it will be catastrophic. And he was, uh, he was clearly disturbed. Clearly disturbed. This was in about 15 minutes of the BBC actually announcing uh, formally, although it had been obvious for hours before this, announcing formally that the, the Leave side had won. Um, and, and Vaz came on and he looked like someone had stolen his ice cream. He looked like, he looked like a small man, um, an intellectual pygmy in a world he no longer understood. And he stood there almost with tears in his eyes and he told the British people, you've got it wrong. You, you should have listened to me. You got it wrong. And, um, well, there you go. It was a wonderful moment. Yes, and another wonderful moment, of course, was the moment that, uh, as predicted, David Cameron came out and resigned. I do not think it would be right for me to be the captain who steers our country to its next destination, he said. 
Uh, he said, I do believe it is in the national interest to have a period of stability and then the new leadership required. In my view, we should aim to have a new prime minister in place by the start of the Conservative Party conference in October. So exactly as we thought. Uh, and, uh, but I thought it was interesting that he is claiming to, uh, to be interested in having a period of stability. I think we can assume there that the, uh, uh, the meaning of that is 180 degrees uh, different. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> certainly if we look what's happening, we'll talk about this in a moment, to, to the Labour Party today, uh, we're clearly heading into a period of instability. Uh, and uh, part of the instability, of course, is coming from the question of, um, are we actually going to leave or not? Uh, and so somebody uh, was emailing out today, um, I don't understand why it's being reported that the Leave MPs are asking for Article 50 not to be invo evoked. Uh, well, in fact, David Cameron also gave a clue as to what's going on here as well, uh, because he says that it should be up to the next Prime Minister to decide when to uh, activate Article 50. So the delaying tactics were not even out, out the gates yet, and it's already being delayed. Stall delay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Corbyn, who of course has been campaigning to stay in, is now saying that Article 50 has to be invoked now. Uh, they're making it up as they go along, I think, in some respects. But perhaps this is a little bit of uh, a little bit of a sort of protest by Corbyn because he's he's been pushed into to supporting the Remain campaign, even though he's been a long time EU, uh, you know, long time against the EU. But he's sort of been pushed by by party po politics, internal party politics, to to uh, uh, stick with the Remain campaign. And it looks like he's uh, he's showing his true colours here. But David, you were saying that there's already a call. For a uh, uh, for a vote of no confidence in Corbyn, yes, that's that's already come from uh, people within the parliamentary Labour Party. So he's likely to go as well. So we'll have it would seem likely a new leader of the opposition as well. Cor Corbyn's performance in this has been very strange. Um, he's a leader who can't really say what he believes in most cases because it's so extreme. Um, but he seems to rebel every now and again when he when he believes something he knows to be true and he and he tells the truth. Um, and he's told the truth about Article 50, and he told the truth about immigration. And, um, yes, yeah, so that's why the, he's uh, going to be out of a job. Uh, well, quite possibly, but I think, the, I think the main problem is that he's not prepared to stand up for what he believes in against uh, the, the, particularly the Blairite faction of the party, uh, and he's busy trying to, trying to herd the cats, as it were, to try to keep this party uh, going in, in a direction. I'm not quite sure that it's his direction, but he's trying to keep it going in a direction. And, uh, I mean... Do you, do you agree with me that that's perhaps the wrong leadership approach in this case? Yes, I mean, the Labour Party have got huge and, 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 and absolutely fundamental problems, which have arisen from the fact that what they, what they believe in and what their political elite have been, have been putting forward for decades is actually quite the opposite of what um, the grassroots working class support that they draw their vote from actually believes in. And this this lying and deceit is finally catching them out. Um, and Mr. Mr. Corbyn has been unable to turn that situation around because, um, well, as you say, ultimately he didn't have the strength of character to do it. Although, had he done that, he would probably have we've had two parties by now. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's move on to the to what's going to happen next. And clearly, the the first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to break up the union. Uh, this, of course, has been uh, part of the constitutional reform agenda for quite some time. But this is Manfred Weber here in the image, uh, who is the uh, leader of the Conservative group in the EU Parliament. He's a very close colleague of uh, Angela Merkel. And he's saying there are upcoming decisions, particularly for Scotland and Northern Ireland. It's up to them. Uh, but it's totally clear that those who want to stay are welcomed in the European Union. So the rhetoric that there was before the uh, in the early days of the referendum, that, that or certainly for the uh, the Scottish uh, independence referendum, uh, that if they were to vote for independence, that there would be no guaranteed membership of the uh, of the European Union. That has suddenly changed. Uh, now you're going to be welcome in the European Union, uh, and uh, and in fact the propaganda in the media about this as well. So here was here's uh, Northern Ireland votes to remain, uh, and and a lot of the. Uh, Rhetoric in the media is it was almost a done deal. Now, of course, it was Scotland was all yellow, but but even there, there was a significant proportion of the population that uh, that were voting to to leave. Uh, so, 
you know, here we've got half half the country population wise in Northern Ireland, uh, more or less voting to leave. What's what's your thoughts on this? Well, the, the exploitation of the situation by the European uh, spokesman there was quite quite remarkable because uh, obviously the, the the political situation was um, that the the Europe would not support a, an independent Scotland because then you would have an independent Catalonia, you would have an independent Basque country, and all of the the uh, powerful players in Europe would be shorn of sections of their tax base, which is what it comes down to, remember. Um, so uh, Scotland was getting no support, and now well, it's, it's changed. Uh, but you have to remember the, the, the equation that is facing the SNP now is actually quite horrific, because what is their policy? Their policy is independence within Europe. Okay, now that's oxymoronic, but that's a policy. So they have um, overcome, for example, the question of, do we really want border controls at Gretna? By saying, well, we're all in the EU together, there won't be border controls at Gretna, but obviously now that's a potential issue. Um, the idea that the people in Scotland are going to be uh, more... Um, feel more affection towards the EU than they do towards Great Britain is is ludicrous. It's it's not going to it's not going to be sustainable, but we're going to hear a lot about it in the next week and month ahead. Uh, yes. Uh and uh it looks like uh also splits in within political parties in Scotland as well. So uh uh the chaos sort of propagates right across the country. Yes, I don't think Ruth Davidson's going to be on Boris Johnson's um, Christmas card list for this. Um, yes, if Boris gets the leadership, apparently the Scottish Conservatives are going to going to spot away from the Conservative Party uh, UK wide. Now, this has been suggested for a very long time as, as Scottish politics diverged to a, a significant degree from from politics in England. Um, there's been voices in the Conservative Party in Scotland for a long time saying we should be an independent party. We should we should um, take our own views and and, and our own uh, uh, you know policy direction and uh, sever the link to London. So that's quite likely to occur now. Um, and no agreement on whether to hold another uh, independence vote. So uh, Herald saying Brexit against Scots wishes would not lead to backing for independence. We've got Chris Grilling. Rejecting Alex Salmon's calls for a uh, for referendum for following a Brexit vote. Uh, but we have the SNP, as you say, uh, seeing its future as part of the EU and, and an attempt by Sinn Féin to uh, cause the same kind of uh, rhetoric in, in Ireland. So, so the, the outcome of this is to put people absolutely against each other. There's going to be a huge amount of instability. There's going to be an attempt. The, the SNP have got one shot left at this, right? But they've now lost two referendums. If they lose a third one, it's it's over. You know, they can't really come back to the constitutional question. Um, the Herald poll showed that the majority of Scots, a greater majority of Scots, would vote uh, to keep the UK together now than than voted that way in 2014. So that's one of the major hurdles that the, the SNP are going to have to overcome if they're going to succeed in breaking up the UK. And another one is uh, to get some sort of engagement in the Westminster Parliament to legitimise this. And a third one is they're going to have to persuade uh, a no campaign in Scotland or, or a stay together campaign in Scotland to actually campaign because we've just had a referendum. It's only 2014. Um, so they have to they have to persuade people to uh, to actually take both sides of the argument. Otherwise, they just look silly. Um, David, I wonder if if I can ask. I haven't easily seen exactly what the percentage of people in uh, Scotland who voted uh, to leave was. Uh, I can see on screen somebody said thirty eight percent, but I don't know whether that uh, that is that, is that's the right. case. That was the over that was the overall um, vote in Scotland was 62 remain, 38 leave. Right. Um, in some parts, uh, Dumfries and Galway, it was almost 50 50. Um, Dundee, which is a national supporting city, uh, it was 60 40. Um, Edinburgh was the, the area, Edinburgh and Glasgow were the areas where uh, the, the, the remain vote was strongest. Edinburgh being also a university town, as is Glasgow. Um, voted in a similar way to places like uh, Cambridge and uh, Oxford. 
Okay, thank you for that. And I'd, I'd just say as a general comment, and we're doing it ourselves at the moment, but it, it can be no wonder that Britain is not moving forward as a nation when you look at the fact that ever since we've been involved with the European Union, we have problems, division, um, uncertainty. And now, of course, uh, Cameron is telling us really quite clearly that we're going into a massive period of uncertainty. Ever since we've been uh, near this uh, horrific institution, the European Union, we are stuck in the mud. We don't get on with our lives. We don't create industry. We're not looking after the people that need, that need our help in society. We're not looking after our children. There's just this constant turmoil over the European Union. And uh, I thought it was remarkable that that lady, um, Charmian Evans, I think her name was, that wrote the article in the Plymouth Herald yesterday really pointed out that when she went to Europe, uh, what did she see but fat cats in huge offices doing nothing and then spending vast amounts of money in all the uh, restaurants. Um, I'm giving a lot of personal opinion here, but it seems to me if you just look at the situation in a simple terms, uh, the EU is a ball and chain around the ankles of the nation whether we're saying we're talking north or south of the border. Have I got it wrong or what? Oh, I, think you've, I think you've got it right. And I'm just going to bring this on screen because, because uh, uh, the propaganda over this, I wanted to highlight this one. We didn't show it yesterday. Uh, Patrick Henningsen showed it to us, pointed it out to us. The propaganda in this is staggering, isn't it? And of course, the implication is that it's if we leave the European Union that the uncertainty arrives from. But the uncertainty, as you say, has been there since we joined. Yeah, and uh, and and these people are these people are telling us that we cannot run a nation. Who who is the Daily Mirror? I mean, who is it? Well, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So the the you know the the mainstream propaganda has been probably the most significant feature of this entire uh, process. Uh, as even within newspaper groups, we've seen opposite positions being taken. Uh, in order to try to manipulate people's minds, uh, but it, it, this yes. isn't good propaganda, though. This this is very poor propaganda. This is this is cliche as political rhetoric. There is no argument there. You know, leap into the dark. What does that mean? Um, there's no case. There's no logic. There's no reason. It's simply looking for a knee-jerk reaction, and it's an absence of, of, of anything positive to say. And that came out of the campaign as well, that what were the people who were advocating remaining in the EU saying, well, it, it's, it's a scary world out there, it'll be Armageddon, the sun will no longer shine, um, and everything you buy will blow up and kill you. You know, that, that was essentially their, their viewpoint. Uh, it, it was nonsense. It was clearly nonsense. They had no positive case because you can't look at the EU institutions and make a positive case. Um, we had, albeit a, we have a very imperfect uh, government and we have very imperfect institutions in this country, but there was a plan um, by our political elite to go and carpet bomb Syria in just the same way we had done to Libya. And there was a public outcry and there was a vote. And actually, history was changed and we didn't do that. Now, they'll keep coming back and trying to further that agenda again, but it did make a difference. I don't remember any time since 1975 where the European Parliament has ever made a difference. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But let's focus a little bit more on the propaganda because, uh, of course, George Soros was uh, one of the propagandists. He was basically making threats to the nation if we were to leave. Uh, and. Uh, Quarter of a century later, Soros warns of another fall in the pound. That was according to the New York Times uh, earlier on, uh, yes, or later on yesterday. And uh, well, this was the Telegraph today. UK now poorer than France as pound hits 30 year low and FTSE 100 drops 5% following British vote to leave the EU. This is <coughs> the most disgraceful uh, headline I think I've ever seen, as we're about to describe. Uh, but uh, of course, five percent fall in the uh, FTSE. Uh, this came uh, in spite of Mark Carnage's uh, claim that uh, he would support everything. Well, perhaps he is. We'll come on to this in a second. But uh, Carney saying the Treasury and the Bank of England have engaged in extensive contingency planning, and the Chancellor and I have been in close contact, including through the night and this morning. The bank will not hesitate to take additional measures as required. Uh, 
as those markets adjust and the UK economy moves forward. So let's look at this massive collapse uh, in the FTSE. Uh, well, it uh, fell 5%, uh, as the Telegraph said, but it stabilized pretty quickly. That perhaps uh, is uh, through some intervention from the Bank of England and the uh, uh, plunge protection team. Uh, but the key point that I've been making for quite a long time is that the uh, FTSE is never allowed to fall below uh, 6,000. Uh, and uh, here's the long term uh, FTSE trend. Uh, certainly since 1998 or so, it has never been allowed to fall below 6,000 for very long. Um, and uh, well, then the other aspect was the currencies, David. And uh, so let's look at some currencies. Uh, here's what happened with uh, the sterling dollar currency pair and it collapsed this morning but uh, found some support uh, at some point and then we have uh, what's this one euro dollar uh, exactly the same it looks uh, and then we have uh, dollar yen here doing exactly the same thing uh, and we have the uh, New Zealand dollar and the US dollar doing pretty much the same thing and oh look let's have a look at gold and it's doing the exact opposite so this is nothing to do with Soros's threatened attack on uh, on the, the British pound. It's Britain is not uh, any poorer today than it was yesterday. In particular, this is merely capital flight out of currencies and into gold, David. Yes, it's it's a flight to perceive safety, a flight to quality in in the, in the case of gold, and a flight to perceived quality in the case of the U.S. dollar. Um, and it's a it's a reaction to the unexpected. It's short term. It really shouldn't uh, concern us greatly. Um, the markets will do what the markets will do. Um, but when you're making decisions regarding the future of your people, uh, you have to take a, a longer term view than uh, the next day on the FTSE. Um, now, uh, the threat from Soros, of course, was that he was going to repeat uh, his activity from Black Wednesday. Uh, the question that I wonder is, is he actually financially capable of having that effect on the markets uh, in you know, 20 years later or whatever it is? What, what's your view? Well, I suspect probably not. Uh, and he's more into, into political causes these days than, than market manipulation. Um, uh, we've, we've also got um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, view that um, sorry, I've just lost my. I've been up all night. I've lost my thread. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> we, we we shall we shall move on. Um, now, uh, so that's one aspect: the propaganda and the uh, the and so on from the media. Uh, but what else is likely to happen? Well, of course, we're seeing increasing increasingly rise of right wing groups uh, across Europe. Uh, we're probably going to see that uh, in this country as well. We're certainly going to see a uh, continuing rise of the police state. Uh, and uh, and uh, we believe that uh, what we're going to see, perhaps, is uh, some Gladio-style activity, uh, not only on mainland Europe, but probably in the UK as well, uh, as, the effect, as time moves on. Um, and uh, so uh, destabilization, chaos, is going to be the order of the day as we, as we delay the, uh, the exit. Uh, and perhaps we might find ourselves in a few months' time, Brian, uh, in a position where... Um, People are demanding, once again, the opportunity to stay in. Uh, well, that, that could easily happen because, of course, the whole of the um, organisation to do that is still in place. And I think this is the thing that uh, uh, we have to work extremely hard to do, which is to uh, give the people who voted leave, and I think that's about 16.9 million people, they need to have the real information about what the problem is. I had a call fairly early this morning from a gentleman up at the London end, and he said, well, the thing is, of course, what has the EU ever really done? Not much. It's been our politicians that have handed everything to the EU on a plate. And I think this is the key thing. People have got to understand that the machinery which is ripping this country apart is within our own parliament, and people have got to understand that and how it's working. And until that is rooted out, uh, we, are, we are not going to see this country coming back on a, an even keel, to use that term. So there's a lot of education that uh, has got to be pushed ahead from now on. This is by no means the end of things, because I think uh, the political agenda is going to be to create absolute mayhem in this country 
so that people are disorientated and they simply can't move to, towards the right position. The traitors, and I'm going to use that word again, the traitors are in Westminster. These are very dangerous people. And um, I wonder what uh, President Putin was thinking to himself as he was having his morning cup of coffee. Because, of course, many of the agencies that he's thrown out of Russia, the NGOs, um, the very dangerous subversive organisations, these are the very organisations that are now causing trouble in the UK. Yeah. Um, I think he must be smiling to himself as, as uh, we see Britain being broken up by a hidden hand, which is facilitated by our own members of parliament. What are your thoughts? I think that's I think that's that's very uh, interesting um, and important points there. It, it is a battle of ideas. Um, the ideas that this country were, was built on, the ideas of liberty and the rule of law, and we've seen those cast aside. We've seen those trampled on, and you're quite right. Principally by our own political overlords, principally by Westminster and Holyrood, um, but the, the EU has been at the heart of a lot of it and has been generating a lot of it and supporting, often directly with financial aid, a lot of these ideas. We have to fight in the, the realm of ideas. Um, I, when we, we started off, we talked about Keith Vaz. Um, I thought he was a man who looked bereft because he realised that he had lost the battle of ideas and that having done so, he no longer mattered. And that was an encouraging moment. Absolutely. Yeah, so these people um, severely challenged because, of course, their whole world view has been turned upside down. But on this subject of what we need to do, the BBC, for example, needs to be brought to account because the arrogance in that organisation, organization, absolutely breathtaking, in that article, which I'll just come back to, I mean, they're simply saying that if you dared to disagree with the BBC's socio-political view, a liberal view, of, of course, highly liberal view, you were a ghastly, awful person. This isn't coming from somebody accusing the BBC of this. It's coming from a man who was working inside the BBC's own policy teams where they were briefing on this. So a vast £3.65 billion propaganda machine spewing this stuff out, an organisation taking taxpayers' money and then turning around and simply laughing at anybody who has got the wisdom to say we, need, we needed to, use, uh, to leave the EU. And I think the other thing I would say, of course, is that many people have been getting very, very hot under the collar on the subject of immigration. But we can see from the polls that uh, were put out publicly that, of course, the government was relying on many of the people that have come in from the European Union in particular to start skewing the vote in favour of Remain. And that, in my opinion, is, is what the immigration is about. It's cynically using people to break up the United Kingdom in order to force through this false liberal BBC type vote. So Mr. Vaz, who's living in the world that he believes the BBC and he believes what comes out of David Cameron's mouth, all of a sudden he's had his worldview shattered and that's why I think he would have looked, um, I'm not sure how you described him then, small and slightly shriveled, I think, because his worldview being challenged. But what an opportunity we've got with, uh, we've now can, it's almost like the smoke has cleared on the battlefield. We've got 16.9 million people who've spoken and said, we don't want the Euro European Union. These are the people that we need to get alongside help encourage, inform as much as possible. And then the other, uh, whatever it is, I've lost my figures here, 15.7 odd million. Uh, these are the people we also need to work on to um, gently knock some sense into them, I think. Yes, so are we done for today? Uh, well, David, if you'd like to add anything from north of the border, you're probably gonna slope away for a cup of tea and then bed, I would imagine. Um, I, I think that what we were faced here was an offer from David Cameron and co to collaborate and, com and, and comply with their own enslavement. And the people of the country said no. And, and that's a start. There's a huge amount to do. 
uh, but it's a start. Uh, Paddy Ashdown tweeted out uh, when the, when the result was known. Um, God help my country. Well, it, it's uh, just possible as uh, last night, in fact, he did. And uh, it's, let's see if we can build on that and get some more truth revealed and um, encourage people to take command of their own lives and not allow our wise overlords to misrule us as they have done so badly in the last 25 years. Absolutely, and perhaps we should also um, give thanks to all the people over very many years who worked so hard uh, to achieve this result and certainly to highlight that the European Union is a dangerous organisation. Uh, we know that as the uh, UK column or even the British Constitution Group, we're quite new players on the scene. We know that many people uh, going back 30, 40 years have been working and campaigning in order to bring the truth out about the European Union. Um, we need to remember those people. We know, of course, all the good work done by smaller parties, UKIP people in particular, but many other uh, people have been out campaigning politically, so they are still going. And really, it's been a team effort, I think, across several generations or, um, that have achieved what's come out of it today. Um, my feeling is that we are at a very critical point. This is not the end of the battle. I think this is about the start. Exactly. So we, we will end on that note. Thank you to everybody that's helped make this possible. I will just... Um, I'll just say, because I did mention her, that I can confirm that Melanie Shaw is currently in, pr in prison. Uh, we'll make some contact details available for people uh, who'd like to, get to uh, write to her. Um, but if we wanted an example of the state of, of David Cameron's Britain in 2016, uh, those who've been abused as children, how does his government reward them? He locks them up in prison. Uh, it's vile, Mike. I, I sometimes am lost for words, but if you want to know what Britain is about, it is about the cover-up of people in positions of political power and establishment power who are abusing children. And I also believe that if we want to stop what is happening with the European Union, we've got to root out the British politicians who are utterly corrupt. These are the people who are happy to see child abuse victims locked up in prison. That's what we need to deal with, and that's got to be the uh, task probably from Monday onwards. Thanks very much for joining us, and as always, if you're not a subscriber, perhaps you consider subscribing to UK Column or making a donation, because we can only do this with your help. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.